This episode of Capes and Lunatics is brought to you by Tweaked Audio. To get awesome headphones, go to tweakedaudio.com and use the coupon code SOUTHGATE to get 30% off, free shipping, and a lifetime warranty. Or you can get there through the link on our website, southgatemediagroup.com. This is Luca Perrick, and you're listening to the Capes and Lunatics podcast. Recording has started. Hello and welcome once again, friends and neighbors, to Super Connectivity. I'm your host, Charlie the Professor Esther, and with me, as always, is the blue-eyed bomber from the Burger Pits. Phil, Phil, me, and Parrish. That's the man. Hey, Philip, glad you could join us once again. Thank you. Okay, uh, so, have you seen Loki? I saw the trailer we got. So, crazy theory. Mm-hmm. You know how there is this thing where they say, well, when you take the Tesseract out of the universe, that causes this thing. But obviously, just moving the Tesseract from whatever its timeline appropriate path was because of time travel, yes, even though it doesn't take it out, I get the feeling there's going to be a lot of chaos that was caused because Loki escaped. I mean, it could just be, I mean, he could be in a different timeline every episode. That could be, I mean, we did, they do call out to TVA and that could be them saying, hey, you know, you got to fix all this damage you wrought. Well, they kind of show that there are these, that there are going to be these multiple timelines. I'm trying to remember, like, there was one thing that's, oh, yeah, that's a whole other thing. And then we also see Loki with the vote Loki yes. uh, button on, which we love. Um, and seeming, I'm guessing that's where he eventually takes over the TVA. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's exciting. And uh, I love, um, uh, which that's Luke Wilson in this. Um, no, Owen Wilson. Right? Owen Wilson. Dang, I can never Lu- tell those two apart. Luke Wilson is on Stargirl. Owen Wilson is here. Yeah, you know what? For a second, when I first watched this trailer, I thought that was the guy who played... Uh, Young Howard, Howard Stark, Howard Stark yeah. in Avengers Endgame, and I was like, "Wait!" Then I saw online they're saying Owen Wilson. I'm like, "Oh, whoa!" No, he's doing his Howard Stark because if you remember, Howard and Reed invented the first time machine. Yes. So I don't know what we're doing here. I don't know where it's going, but boy, Hiddleston is pretty. Ah! <laughs> and you know, this is this interesting thing where one actor immediately becomes a phenomenon, which is at once beautiful and I imagine difficult for the poor guy because now he's like only known as one thing and now he's only going to get cast for certain things. And, you know, he auditioned for Thor. He was supposed to be Thor. And, oh, but now he's this. And it's like, oh, okay, so this is going to be a different thing. And, oh, but I enjoy it. I enjoy it so much. Mm -hmm. I enjoy it so much, and it's just a teaser. We don't get much, but we do see that there's like you know the the TVA, you know, <laughs> which they always call the TVA. So time passes differently here at the TVA. How long have you been here? So, I don't know. It's been a long time. Yeah, it's one of those things where it's like, man, are they just setting that up to be like a total misdirect at the end? Of this? No, we're at the Time Variance Authority. We're the tutti frutti. Vivastic apple pickers. You know, I don't know. I don't know what they're going to be, but like, no, the TVA doesn't mean that. Or even like, oh no, well, we call it the TVA because it sort of looks like a T and a V and an A in, in Terran English, in Terran English uh, lettering. But really, it, that's just that's just a shorthand we use. But actually, what it is is this archaic symbol that means that sort of like the Jeremy Bear mm. If you remember from the good place, where it's like. We just call it the Jeremy Bear me because, weirdly enough, in cursive English, it looks like the name Jeremy Bear me. I just wonder if they're just going to be like, you know, time variance authority. Yeah, you know what? Because you, th- oh, you think uh, with those st- with those uh, pin particles, that was the first time humanity's ever tried the time the time travel. Oh no, it's just that you know, any, any other time people have tried to uh, time travel, we've we've slapped them down. Well, and to be fair, for for what it's worth, there is a time stone. So obviously, people have been time traveling for a long time. Yeah. Also, the tesseract, as any student will tell you, is technically a fourth dimensional object, and therefore travels in time. I'd like to call it the cosmic cube. 
Yes. Well, because it is a cosmic cube. It is. Because here's the thing. Hmm. A cosmic cube can make anything happen. If you can go back in time and change how things play out, you could make anything happen. Mm-hmm. As we saw. That's the thing. That's where the Tesseract becomes way more. Everyone just thinks, oh, this moves you from point A to point B. It's sort of like um, if you will, will, will recall from Rick and Morty. When Rick is trying to do the whole teleportation thing, and the other Rick from another dimension comes to him and says, yeah, trying to work out teleportation, yeah, it's a dead end. Because you know what happens when you crack teleportation? You find out you're the last guy. You're just the last guy to figure out teleportation. He says, what you want to do is dimensional travel, and that's that gets you to this next level. You know, Because really, the, the gun is still a teleportation gun, but it's also a dimensional gun. And it's also, you know, it basically, it works throughout all these things. And that's sort of what the Tesseract is, is by becoming this, by grabbing the Tesseract, he is able to move throughout space and time because the Tesseract, again, moves in space and time. Those who have been touched by the Tesseract are all characters who get displaced in time. Either uh, Steve Rogers, who gets frozen, or the Red Skull, who transcends into some wraith being. Yeah, like we like we think that's the last we've seen of him. Um, no, that's the thing. It's like once once the stone has served its purpose, what does he do? Does he still stand there once the stone is gone? Mm. You know, or does he, you know? It's like, well, I guess I'll just stand here. Or does he go with the stone? And speaking of, well, that's the soul stone. But speaking of the mind stone, we got our WandaVision trailer drop. Yeah, a lot more in that one. The Agatha Harkness character is given to show that she doesn't know why she's here either. Um, Monica Rambeau doesn't know why she's there, which is interesting because I do wonder if they're trying to backdoor in Monica Rambeau's original origin within the context of light and dark energy that they stole for Cloak and Dagger and perhaps are going to merge it all together. Maybe we're going to get our backdoor of Cloak and Dagger into this. Oh, maybe. Wouldn't that be interesting? You know, like I say, you know, I, I will never stop believing that Marvel television is not at least somewhat canonical. They can recast. They can ignore what happened there. So, for example, if we meet Hellstrom later mm-hmm. and it's a different actor, I will guarantee you there'll be some mention of something that happened in this series, not heavily. And it's, it's sort of like what you get with the Star Wars Legends. So with the Star Wars Legends, as, as you know, me and Tristan talk about all the time, you know, the, it's not that they've been made non-canon. It's that they're now legends. These are legends that people believe about these things. Now, we may get confirmation of these legends, mm-hmm. but for right now, they're just legends. So right now, I kind of see the Netflix universe, Hellstrom, all connect, and maybe even some parts of Peggy Carter probably. And Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. All in that le- that MCU Legends field. Where they're going to bring stuff in. And they are, are going to bring stuff in. You know, that's the thing. Is like There is so much fan demand to bring stuff in. Oh, yeah. There's not an argument not to. You know, there's no reason for Feige to just say, no, we refuse to bring, uh, you know, Charlie Cox as over as the... Uh, as the character uh, Daredevil, you know. Oh, it's just a license to print money. Well, exactly. It's like everyone likes him. Everyone likes what you did in that story, so bring it over. Meanwhile, obviously, there has never, ever been an Inhumans film, a live-action adaptation. You know, no. we know that they never made one, so we'll have to see what eventually Marvel decides to do with that. <laughs> Again, with a WandaVision, you can wipe that show away and bring in, like, good humans. Well, but that's the thing. You don't even have to wipe it away. It just never happened. Yeah. That's the thing. It's like it didn't touch us. It's like any of the weird X-Men stuff. That never touched us. But was there something you liked? Well, maybe we're going to do that. Although Hugh Jackman doesn't want to come back as Wolverine, so probably not. We didn't watch the new Mandalorian. It's not on. Oh, it's on today. Yeah. No, we didn't watch the new Mandalorian. <gasps> wow. That's on. Yeah, look at that. Look at that. And my friend at work today was even saying, hey, did you see the new Mandalorian? I'm like, oh. Yeah, yeah, I saw it. It was great. Yeah. And it's like, yeah, you know. And 
Like, oh my god! And then it struck me. Wait, was there a new one? And I just realized. Oh, it's Friday. Yeah. I just realized today. I just just now realized today was Friday. No. Even though I knew it was Friday the whole day, I don't know it's Friday until Mandalorian. And I'm like, oh, Friday Mandalorian. Yeah, yeah. So I have no idea what happened with Baby Yoda this week. Uh, last I saw, he was being, you know, uh, basically he was beating up stormtroopers and then fell asleep. Um, <laughs> Because it's tiring. You didn't see the Mandalorian do the unthinkable, eh? Oh, did you already see it? Yes, I did. Yes, I did. Oh, goodness. Well, I'm hoping Baby Yoda's still with us. But if not, that's uh, that would be a real dark turn, Favreau. So, that would be a real freaking dark turn. Kind of a spoiler. We don't see Baby Yoda this week. Oh, that's fine. As I said last week... um, you know, this is this episode is, you know, uh, the Dirty Dozen. Yeah. This is literally... Okay, let me get some expendable characters. Yeah. Sorry, Gina, you probably shouldn't have tweeted that. You're expendable now. <laughs> yeah, okay, you're going to tweet that. Well, let's see. You know what? I think your character deserves a tragic death. <laughs> I think next week might be the finale already. It's episode eight. I know. That's the weird thing, man. It's like, are we already at that? And, you know, they do like a whole one hour episode. Yeah, I can say I could probably wrap up a lot of stuff. Well, I fi- figure it's the week before Christmas. They'll wrap that, you know, exactly one week before Christmas. That'll wrap up that season. And then one division starts January 15th. <laughs> exactly. You know, they got to space it out. So me and Miles have time to finish one show and start the next. They know they're timing it. They're timing it all around. Okay, okay. Oh, yeah. They're gonna do this one next. So let's do let's put this here. So they start talking about that. You know. Oh yeah. Once the system's in place, I think they're pretty much gonna. It's either gonna be Star Wars or Marvel. There's gonna be as soon as one ends, another one's gonna start up and boom, boom, boom. Yeah. And for what it's worth, you know, I think Wandavision is gonna be pr- pretty fantastic. Oh yeah. You know? I mean, you know, it's gonna be interesting. Here's you know, here's what I'm gonna say. When I say it's gonna be fantastic, it's gonna be fantastic in a very different way. Than Mandalorian is. Oh yeah, because Mandalorian is fantastic in the sense that it is a western, it's, and it's like a new original thing when it comes to Star Wars. Well, exactly, and that's the thing. It's like there is so much of Star Wars that is so much retread. Yeah, and it doesn't have to be, and it really, mm. arguably, was never supposed to be. But I think it sort of, you know, I think the problem with Star Wars was it was too big of a hit. Yes. And so it created its own fandom, and fandom is its own worst enemy. So, you know, and I think Star Trek gets this sometimes too, but at least Star Trek reinvents things. You know, Star Trek did the bold idea of, what if we did something different next time? And that's when they did Next Generation. And it was really, honestly, just a cost-saving measure, because they didn't want to pay all of these... They didn't want to do another series with all the old actors... Because first of all, they were all old, and they all had progressed in their lives, and characters had progressed. So it's like you can't have Captain Sulu and Captain Chekhov, you know, running the bridge under Admiral Kirk. It doesn't make any sense. No. You know, from from the entire structure, it doesn't, doesn't work. You know, so they created Next Generation, and then they created other generations after that. And I really think that is... As much as Star Trek was a cultural touchstone before that, I think that's what made it into a cultural icon. Oh, yeah. It made it a, big, a bigger expanded universe. Before that, it was just the one ship, basically. Exactly. And I think that's the idea. It's like, you know, the the movies and things like that are your touchstone, but you actually want to be an icon. You want something about this to be more than those. You don't want to be hopping across... The pond, mm-hmm. jumping from stone to stone to stone to stone. You want to swim in the pond. You want to feel that universe around you and feel what's being built for you. And that is, that is, I think, what the Mandalorian does for Star Wars. The way, arguably, all of the side media did for Star Wars before it. All of the legends did for Star Wars before it. And that was the thing. It's like, Star Wars always had an expanded universe. But there was so much in it that you just couldn't wrap your head around it. And parts of it conflicted with other parts. And that's always a thing. Whether or not a freaking lightsaber is plasma is still a fight I have online 
every freaking day. It's not plasma, dudes. It's concentrated force energy. No. You know, everyone, I built a real plasma sword. It's like, great. So you, so you're Thundar the Barbarian. <clears throat> That's a plasma sword. Everything about the sun sword says that there's a plasma sword. It is not a lightsaber. That's a very different thing. Thundar the Barbarian, very cool. We all love Thundar. Say you've created a Thundar the Barbarian like sun sword because that's what you built. You did not build a lightsaber. Thanks for playing. You know, it's like when everyone says, oh, it's a hoverboard. And it's, it's two wheels. Hoverboard. <laughs> I am really shocked Lilith got, got one of those for, for her birthday. Honestly, for, cause first of all, I thought hoverboards were like, you know, a decade ago, but you know, oh! yeah, I understand nostalgia. I understand, nostalgia. I understand the desire to just roll, just, to just roll with it. Um, and what is more Lilith than to just roll with it? Oh, she, she never, you know, interjects it. Hmm. That's interesting. Thing. Um, but yeah, so that's uh, that's a whole thing there. Um, what were we talking about? Well, <laughs> we're talking about Loki, and then we got into WandaVision. Yes. Then we got way off, way off topic there. Uh, let's talk mutants. Okay. Because mutants are weird in the Marvel Universe of late. <laughs> Uh, and to do that, you want we're going to throw in some comic books into this because I do want to talk Juggernaut number four, Ooh. where you know it's actually really cool, especially with D Cell's whole shtick of saying I'm not a mutant, mm-hmm. which is surprisingly reminiscent of Ms. Gwenpool's I'm not a mutant, and many other people like Quill saying I'm not a mutant before. Eventually, it was just, no, you're a mutant, so you're going to be a mutant. Which makes me wonder, are mutants really even mutants? Or are they just people with superpowers? Which is something I get into this idea of within the structure of the MCU, they may be leaning towards. That it's not that you're a mutant or you're not a mutant. It's that you're. there are certain people who have superpowers. Why they have superpowers, who knows? This idea that there's this special X gene. First off, have they isolated the X gene? Have they been able to replicate the I don't know. It's weird. It's crazy. I mean, Mr. Sinister says he does it, but Mr. Sinister is a freaking monster. <laughs> is a literal human monster. Like, you know, they say, no, you know, Frankenstein's technically the monster. It's like, yes, but Dr. Frankenstein actually is the monster. In in Mr. Sinister, it's stop, you're both right. There's, there's two, he is the monster and the monster. There's there, uh, there's bad things going on there. They're, they're, they're clones or something. It's, you know. Yeah, and we get this whole thing here, because apparently you have this very complex issue with for-profit supervillain prisons. Um, which makes sense because, hey, capitalism and, you know, late stage capitalism. Um, and basically, Arnim Zola is trying to, you know, of course, doing all of his studies and experiments with things. And there's an interesting aspect of this where they say that Arnim Zola is being controlled as well. Because we see that um, the plasmoid character is being controlled, which is this guy who. Unlike a lot of, you know, his Doughboy do kind of characters, has a real, um, seems to have a real character and, like, opinion on things. Hmm. You kind of feel, he kind of feels like a Star wars droid. You know, just to give, give you a little synergy here. Where he's, like, talking, but he says, no, actually, I can't do, I literally can't do anything that, you know, Arnim Solo doesn't tell me to do. But, um... Oh, yeah, and then we have this... You keep on having these interstitials of uh, Marco and Cytorak, where he basically he gets his new armor, he reclaims the gem, but it's all literally so that he can says, say, I have your power now, but I'm not your avatar. Hmm. I have all my power back, but I'm not your avatar. I don't have to do what you tell me to do. Because I'm not going to do what anyone tells me to anymore. Uh, I'm going to make right with my world. And, you know, that's a pretty noble thing. And he, like, stops Diesel from killing 
uh, Arnim Zola because he doesn't want to be, but you don't want to be like him. And then next next episode, and I knew it. I knew it from the start. The minute they said, "Oh, there's some kind of radioactive control in the sand purse," I was like, "Swarm's going to be a part of this, isn't he?" Because immediately when they, you know, because as soon as I saw the quick sand, I was like, "Oh yeah." Nazi scientist Swarm. I knew Swarm was coming back. Swarm is back. Theory confirmed. B's on the cover of Juggernaut 5. So I liked this. But um, again, this whole idea of what makes someone a mutant, that's the question that we have to have. I am waiting for Valeria and Franklin to have that one-on-one talk about, you know, you know, you know how Ben gets to be human now. Mm-hmm. Because you were part of that project too, so you and us both know that we're just creating a method for him to get beyond his psychic barrier. And you've built your own psychic barrier. You're basically the reverse thing. You want so badly to be human, and now you get to be, and you're mad about it. The same way that Ben wants so badly to be human, and then when he's human, he's always immediately mad about it. So yeah. But um, along the lines of mutants, we also got Avengers yep. 39 this week. Which suggests mutants are far older than we have suggested. Although, again, it's not like they're bringing in all the six-fingered kids. Um, you know? And that's my biggest problem with the mutants. Is that, well, of course... Technically, polydactylism isn't necessarily a mutation. It's just a genetic difference. But then again, I love you too, Tristan. Like, what makes someone a mutant, what makes you a mutant is that you have a genetic expression that didn't exist in your parents. Except that's not how the um, how the how how mutants are defined in this. Because they actually have that all humans have the X gene. It's just whether or not the X gene expresses itself. Which means that that means that mutants aren't mutants at all. <laughs> They're actually just normal people. Exactly. But um, that's and I I do think they're building towards something. Here. I actually think there is a plan for the mutants that is basically going to make it. As I said, that mutants who have always been here always were here. Because even in this, we see mutants have always been here, always were here. Which, if you think about it. From the minute you had Apocalypse as a mutant before the nuclear age, before the children of the atom, at that moment you create that idea that, yeah, mutants have been around for a long time. Which I guess technically means Namor isn't the first mutant. Yeah. But again, as I've said, it's not like Namor really is the first mutant. He's a hybrid and he was, he was, it was, it was advantageous to Charles. To have Namor on his team if he wanted him, you know. Uh, I just, but we get in, yeah. I don't know. Just this prehistoric stuff. I mean, if you want like superhumans at the dawn of time, that's fine. But I'm just like, I don't know. I kind of like our characters to be unique, and it's just like, oh, you have pre, you had prehistoric Avengers, you had prehistoric X Men. It's just like, well, but the idea, and this is the thing. Once you tie it to Norse mythology, once you tie it to the Brotherhood of the Shield. You know, it's like Marvel's been building out this cosmic backstory for a long time now. Yeah. You know, since Hickman was doing his thing over in in S.H.I.E.L.D., you know, which was this idea that, oh, what if S.H.I.E.L.D. is this ancient order? What if Hydra spins off of that under Newton? You know, what if everything we think is this modern 20th century invention actually has this deeper, darker um, history that we haven't really explored, you know? And I think that's something that they're also doing with the Avengers right now with Howard Stark being, having something to do with Mephisto. Hmm. You know, this just this idea that, you know, maybe Howard Stark started in, in, in the secret brotherhood of the shield, but got recruited into the secret brotherhood of the Hydra. Ew. Of which you know that, and maybe it is actually the Mep- the Mephistophelian Brotherhood. You know that maybe that's what Newton uncovered was the secret to power is these demons. Ew. Although again, as as James Oder would say, you know the problem with you smart people is you never think. <laughs> he says he's a demon. 
calls himself the Prince of Lies. That should tell you something. <laughs> you know. Oh, and I love that thing in the t- in the just to bring it all for full circle the 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 Loki trailer where um, you know says I don't like to talk. So well, now that's a lie. <laughs> you really like to talk. So yeah, um, you know, here's what I'll say: it's like I don't mind that Marvel history rhymes. Yes, I don't mind that there is a whole plot line in there where. The um, where these characters, especially a character like the Phoenix, that the Phoenix has been around for millennia, and I kind of get this idea within it that the Phoenix gets fundamentally fundamentally changed by the redheaded mutant mm. who dies and comes back, who feels other people's deaths. Because I think in that there is this concept of um, what I like to call reverse apotheosis. You know, when you talk about most stories and myths, they're usually about apotheosis, which is this idea that a mortal being becomes a god, that they transition from that mortal world to becoming a god. And in becoming a god, they become all-powerful, and yada, yada, lightning bolt, lightning bolt, lightning bolt. But I think what is interesting in some myths, and I think the myths that have the most power, the myths like the myth of Heracles, uh, like uh, the story of Jesus, and many other characters, is this idea of a reverse apotheosis, where an infinite godlike being becomes mortal. And the moment they understand a mortal, they suddenly become shocked by their godly disregard for the universe. And in this case, once the phoenix touches the little red-haired girl, just like Charlie Brown fell in love with, um, once um, the phoenix becomes a part of the little red-haired girl, she is going to destroy the world as the phoenix is wont to do. But because she is touching that human spirit, that human spirit that has connection to other living things, that human spirit that wants to be a part of the world, that's where the Phoenix can't do, can't pull the trigger, can't just destroy. Mm. And I think that the end scene in this is really neat when the Phoenix, very self-aware, tells Odin, you know, I'm here to recruit you to save the planet from, from essentially from, from people like us and us ourselves. This idea that, you know, yeah, you know, we are as much of a threat to this world as anything. And it's important for us to fight that. And I like that. I, I, you know, within the context of whatever that's bigger that they're building, I'm working with it and I'm feeling very positive about it. But that's my opinion. What, the whole, (laughs) the whole, uh, pre, the, uh, prehistoric Avengers thing? Well, I think what the idea is is that they're trying to say that everything that exists does exist within a context of a world that was always more than it seemed to be. I guess so. You know, there's there is this again, going back to my one of my favorite comic books ever printed, the official handbook to the Marvel Universe, uh, or possibly Marvel Saga it was said in as well was that the tradition of becoming a masked superhero was well established in our world by the time that such and such gained power. That by the time this person gained power, everybody thought, was, well, I guess I'll get a costume and be a supervillain then, since that's what you do, or get a costume and be a superhero, because that's what you do. That, That basically, Marvel's been doing this for years, going back to their old West comics, where they also said, you know what, let's say that the old West characters did that, that that's why the... They're wearing the masks and they're doing the Lone Ranger bit. And I think what Marvel does in a way that I think that DC doesn't do as much is that Marvel really loves to go back and build that. Although, to be fair, DC is doing apparently a Justice League a, a 1 million BC or 1 million AD or 1 million something because they have... Shining Knight and Hippolyta and 
a couple of other characters forming their own first Justice League, where the Shining Knight is like your Batman, which is ironic because he's the Shining Knight, but... Oh, no, no, it's the Viking Prince. The Viking Prince, not the Shining Knight. That's right. It's Viking Prince, Hippolyta, and then there's two other characters that are clearly... Oh, Swamp Thing is in it, too. This is in... What book is this? And I only read the, 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 the discussion of it, but yeah. Oh, this is the, no, this is the start of the endless winter story or whatever they're calling it this week. Um, yeah. So oh. basically in that story, you know, you have Hippolyta, the Viking prince. Oh, uh, Black, Black Ad- Adam. Black Adam. Black Adam. And I think there's someone else in there. And then Swamp Thing. Swamp Thing? But I guess. The first Swamp Thing, because now even the Swamp Thing isn't, like, a new character. Isn't just uh, not Ted Salas. It's actually this other guy. Which, again, Marvel already established with the idea that the man thing existed before Ted Salas and yada, yada, yada. You know, DC, they like to copy. But, yeah, so... Yeah, well, it it actually, yeah, because Endless Winter went in the Flash, so it was actually in yeah this week's Flash. Yeah, mm-hmm. it showed they. I guess they had battled the, this Frost King back in the day. Uh, yeah. Oh, tenth in the tenth century. Yeah. Yes. The tenth. Oh, the tenth. So a mere one thousand years ago, really? Pretty much. Yeah. Well, I guess if you want to have uh, Tothamon in it, I guess you kind of can't go back too far. Although, actually, I thought, no, Tothamon was in B.C. Oh, but he was buried under the rock. But then, I don't know. D.C., get your timeline straight. Uh, anyway, Viking Prince. So, yeah, so he's the Batman. Hippolyte is the Wonder Woman. Um, Tothamon is Superman. And then Swamp Thing is Swamp Thing. So that's good. But you know who they don't have in that team? Conan the Barbarian. Oh, yeah, he's got an enchanted sword that makes him kill people. And it's driving him crazy. Because the sword wants blood. Which makes, really, I don't know, it, it's kind of nuts in this whole episode. Because it's like, you're not sure, like, is Conan killing people that are, like, thieves and murderers? Or is he just murdering random people because the sword tells him that they're thieves and murderers? It's it's a little dark, a little uncomfortable, I'm going to be honest with you. Um, still enjoy Conan. It's a good book. I got a free Conan poster uh, at uh, the comic book store this week, so I was very happy about that. Um, but yeah, Conan the Barbarian, it's its pretty neat, but yeah, he's got an evil enchanted blade that eats souls, so that's not good. Uh, anyway, do you have any other books you want to talk about this week, um, Phil? Yeah, we're going to put those. Here we are. Uh, well, well, I know you did say something about Spider-Man, so Amazing Spider-Man 54. I mean... There really wasn't a ton here. I mean, yeah, Peter confronts Harry and he, you know, Harry, you know, Peter's like, you know, we've done this before, you know, basically saying, oh, you know, you know, the guy with the daddy issues comes at me and, you know, and basically Harry's like, no, not this, you know, this time. I'm, I guess he's basically demonic. <laughs> and he basically, okay. he basically beats Peter to death and brings him back to life. Okay. Because he's well, like, uh. Yeah. How does he put it? Uh, he's like, I'm going to show you what hell looks like. It's worse, you know, there's something worse than death here because he beats him to death. And then he's like, you know, it's, I guess, suffering. Uh, okay. Oh, because they're in like the mindscape realm or something. Well, okay. well, and then Harry, and Harry says, you know, because you're the, you know, you're the cause of everyone's suffering and stuff. And, mm. and then when all the spider people show up, he's like, oh, look, here comes your friends. And oh, look, there's the sin eater. And Peter's like, no, you know, don't. They're walking into a trap. But then. Harry's like, oh, someone always pays a price unless you confess. And then at the last page, you see Mary Jane showing up. Oh, no. Okay. So, I mean, Harry keeps t- asking him to confess. So I'm wondering if he means the Mephisto deal. That's what I'm saying. I wonder if, like, Harry got damned somehow from Peter making the deal. Because, yeah, Harry was dead until he made that deal. Then all of a sudden, it's like, oh, no, Harry was just in Europe for a couple of years. Yeah, but it's... Yeah, well, that's where Osborns go when they die. Where do Osborns go when they die? They go to Europe. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, yeah, I mean, okay. I, cause, cause this would I, go to that whole, whole idea that maybe Mary Jane knows. Maybe that's who needs to confess. Maybe. Because there is that, what did Mary Jane whisper to Mephisto before she took the deal? Oh. Um. That's the big mystery. 
and everybody like zooms it. Well, we zoomed in on the lettering. It's like, no, you didn't. You're lying. Because they don't write the lettering in a way that you could just zoom in on it. That would be stupid. Yeah. Um, and again, this that is, would be a stupid way to maintain a mystery, you know? Yeah. And again, I mean, anyone who worked on that is long gone. So it's like. <laughs> yeah. But I mean, yeah, I th- it's just Harry seems to be blaming Peter, for, you know, for everyone's suffering. So I'm like, again, I'm a, is it the Harry suffering? Again, did the deal do something to Harry? You know, was he at peace? And it's like, oh, no, you, you know, you cursed me and brought me back. Blah, blah, blah. That's just, that's all in his mind. Wasn't Harry. You know, it's like that whole thing in Ghost Rider where they have the the traveler. Just call me JC. Ah! My long hair, man. Beard. It's like, oh goodness! Clearly, you are this person. Nope, I'm Mephisto. Ha ha! You thought white Jesus was real Jesus. See, that was your own prejudice. I, Take that, Ghost Rider. I think that was just you know some and of the that, some of the riders, some of the readers were like, oh, you can't be blasphemous against Jesus, but oh, oh, you can mess with the devil all you want. <laughs> well, I, although I, like I said, I'm just I'm just saying how that how that story would read today. We almost say, wait a minute. Why is Jesus white? You know? Exactly. <laughs> Why are you having this white, black, blue-eyed guy Char- be Jesus? Why do you think of that Jesus? That looks like Charles Manson, if you ask me. <laughs> There's still those pictures of, uh, you know, it's like, oh, remember what the reason for Christmas? And it's like supposed to be a picture of Jesus, but it's a picture of uh, e- uh, you, you and McGregor from uh, as Obi Wan Kenobi, <laughs> young Obi Wan. Yeah, Kenobi. well, yeah, yeah. Well, you know. Reason is festive consumers day, my friend. The nagus of conspicuous consumption shall arrive and give great bargains to all the good little Frangi who study their rules of acquisition at night. Oh, you know what uh, issue was interesting? Uh, Guardians of the Galaxy 9 by our friend Al Ewing. Oh, how's that going? I mean, well, a couple issues back, he looked like he killed off Peter Quill, and I guess and Quill's like... In this issue, it looks like he's in another dimension. It is kind of like in a throuple with some alien man and woman. And it seems like he's there for like, a, I don't know, like 100 years or 200 years or something. But it's like, it almost seems like Al Ewing's trying to tie the two Star Lord origins together because before the whole, you know, he was a kid picked up yeah. by Yondu and stuff, you know, it, it was that whole, it was like a space wizard pro points him like the Star Lord or whatever. Yeah, there were all sorts of I things. I mean, yeah, because yeah, he... There's uh, like six different Star Lord origins. Yeah. Even one where he was just the prince of Abraxas or something, you know? Yeah, because, I mean, he's getting flashes of, you know, that that whole thing, you know, him get, being appointed by this, you know, old yeah. man on his throne. And it's just like, I get flashes of that sometimes, you know? Yeah, that's the gag. That's what Marvel does. They're not going to... It's continuity, baby. We don't let continuity... We don't let that continuity last yeah. forever, man. Oh, you thought we didn't know about that? No, we remembered. We remember. Yeah, because it looks like he gets appointed. Then he Marvel wakes up. Farms remembers. Yeah, then he. Yeah, it looks like he gets appointed. Then he wakes up as a child. Yeah. <laughs> but it's like, how does your how does your element gun work? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> it just always it dies. Just does elements. And sometimes shoots bubbles. <laughs> That was the best effect in all of in, in all of Infinity War. Just Thanos likes bubbles, uh, which shows that Thanos has a playful nature. He was he really just wanted to be a big jolly guy, but everyone just wouldn't listen to him. I think he was just trying to show him how insignificant he was. Hmm, I don't know. Maybe you come out with toys. Uh, Except it wasn't really a toy. Obviously, you've altered reality. So yes, you're you're, you're not playing fair, Thanos. And really, what what is you know? It's uh, Thanos. Nobody liked you, Thanos. Go home, it man. wasn't a practical thing. Everyone who actually knows about anything said, "Yeah, actually, it wasn't a practical plan. It was actually a really stupid plan, and it really doesn't work." That's right. Especially when you kill half the trees. <laughs> like I will just get rid of half the resources in this planet. It's like, dude, if humans eat trees, you know that, right? It's uh-huh. like you can't, you can't kill the living things that all the living things survive on. That's why you're dumb. That's why you're dumb, Thanos. You're a dumb guy. That's the problem with smart people. You don't think. Oh, it is just. Uh, anyway, so yeah, Thanos is. Dumb. Dead, hopefully. This week. 
Uh, <laughs> uh, anything else you want to talk about this week, Phil? No, I think we're good. I think we're very good, you know. Um, and I was, but I yeah. just wanted to say before we go, uh, everyone, remember, next two weeks, Capes and Lunatics are going to be pre-recorded. So if there's any big uh, news items, remember, come here to Super Connectivity. That's where we'll be talking in the next two weeks. Because yep, I have no life. Me neither. Yay. That's what happens when you have kids. <laughs> I guess you can all you have. I was like, no, I'm actually going to go out because hey. I don't have kids, and I will actually eat a steak. Hey, and... there's a pandemic this year. It's responsible. Yes, well, fair enough. Um, but I was like, I'm going to be irresponsible in my house and eat a steak in my house and just not do this stuff because I have things I want to do. She's focusing on writing the great American novel. You there know, I should have written a novel. I didn't. Why? Because I'm doing podcasts. And I have kids. See? Someone write this down. Balance. Oh, it's being recorded. I'm, it's going to be somewhere. Anyway, uh, you know, Philip, uh, I've enjoyed listening to you, talking to you. But, you know, many people don't enjoy listening to us. And you know why, Philip? You know why they don't enjoy listening to us? Because they don't have tweaked audio headphones. That's correct. And they should just go to tweakedaudio.com, use the coupon code Southgate at checkout, and get some high-quality earbuds that are Bluetooth enabled even because, you know, the kids love the Bluetooth um, and listen to this uh, episode in stereophonic sound. Come back and listen. You'll hear much more interesting things you didn't hear the last time. Uh, likewise, use that same coupon code Southgate. Go over to HunterKiller.com. Uh, get an escape room delivered to your house and then just put in that code and get a discount on that too because you can use that code more than once, which is Weird, because most coupons you can't, but this one you can. Um, likewise, you should pick up Pod Life the Book, which is a great book about podcasting. Uh, a second volume is coming soon, and in this situation, you might also be able to get the digital book as well as the hard copy. So if you want to prepare for the apocalypse, get it in hardcover or softcover. Uh, if you really think, you know what, technology will continue to expand throughout eternity, uh, get the digital book, and that's fine too. Uh, might be an audiobook coming. I don't know. Um, you know, uh, he's like, uh, like, um, George Costanza. He does not, he likes, he prefers audiobooks. Oh, yes. Audiobooks. Because <clears throat> otherwise, you know, when it's an audiobook, it's all these different voices. When it's just him, it's just his voice in his head. It just doesn't work. Without a doubt. Uh, Meanwhile, um, if you want to do any of that, go down to our show notes, uh, click on the link to Amazon. That's where you can buy that stuff. We also have like a whole gift guide, which you can pick out gifts for your friends, family, loved ones, or just for yourself. So do that too in this holiday season of giving. And in the final uh, analysis, uh, Philip, if someone wants to write to us and talk to us about whatever, how can they do that? Uh, the easiest way is to email us, capesandlunatics at gmail.com, or call the voicemail, 614-382-2737. That's 614-38-CAPES. And you can find links to all the various, all our social media, uh, links to the YouTube channel, links to merchandise, links to Patreon, everything at linktree, L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash capesandlunatics. And, of course, you can always write to me in that old-fashioned email way the way our miles and pause once did at superconnectivityblog at gmail.com. That's superconnectivityblog, all one word, at gmail.com. And, of course, follow me on the Twitter as I live tweet the final season of DuckTales. Mondays at 7 p.m. Eastern Time, when I remember. At Charlie Esser, but C-H-A-R-L-I-E-S-O-C-R. Look for the two E's in the middle. For quality. Bing! Thank you, Maz. Well, ladies and gentlemen, this has been another episode of Super Connectivity. Wenja, come on back next week and super connect with us again. There might be more Marvel news. So are we doing Wonder Woman on the 1st of January, or... Uh, sometime that weekend, whenever we schedule that, yes. Okay. Well, I don't know, you're the one that schedules these things. So well... That's, that's all I'm saying. See when the great little hellfire gets back to town. But it'll hit the podcast January 4th. January 4th, okay. That's when it'll be on the podcast. 
Wonder Woman.